Okay, welcome everybody to this expert talks. Today we are talking with Erin <laughs> Peets. They're a non-binary femme and a conscious dating coach, and we're so so excited for our conversation today. Erin, um, can you tell us just a little bit about what you do, what you're here to talk about today? Yeah, so I'm a conscious dating coach. So I specialize in teaching people how to make great decisions in dating and how to really love themselves before getting into a relationship. And today what I'm talking about is being the person that you want to date, mm. embodying the person that you want to date, which is like one of my favorite topics yeah. in the entire world. <laughs> so tell us more about what does that mean to, to embody the person that you want to date? So in science and in psychology, they've found that people um, tend to want to be in a relationship with someone who kind of embodies their childhood wounds, mm. right? So subconsciously, what happens is that the things that we weren't allowed to be or the things that we have the most wounding around are subconsciously the things that we seek out in a partnership. Mm -hmm. So being the person that you want to date is all about embodying those things for yourself so you can avoid those kind of uh, toxic relationships that are just like happening over and over again, those patterns that we follow and really start to heal yourself so you can attract the relationship that you actually want. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That sounds really awesome. Um, and like a really empowered way to go about dating and attracting the right partner. But yeah. could, you, could you talk a little bit about like how a person does that? Yeah. So when you're trying to find out um, the kind of pieces of yourself that you want to embody, the best way that I've found to do that is to really figure out where your wounding is, really figure out where your shadow is. Those, um, you know, I started out with my own story when I started doing this because this also works when you're in a relationship if you want to um, enhance your relationship and make it a lot healthier. But when I started doing this, I started looking at the partners that I've had in the past, right? And there are a lot of their commonality, commonalities and why I felt so drawn to them. Um, like one guy that I dated for a really long time uh, who was terrible for me, but... <laughs> Um, I was so drawn to them because they were like this magnetic personality who had all of these friends and I was kind of a, a little bit of a, um, I wasn't told enough that I was like worthy when I was a child. So seeing someone else be like inherently worthy in their own, I was like, oh, I'm so drawn to that. Like I'm so attracted to that. And I ended up going back and thinking like, okay, like how can I embody that in my own life? How can I bring the idea of being magnetic in my own life? So I started with affirmations. I did embodiment work on, you know, different archetypes. An archetype of, for me being like almost like a lioness woman, like someone who is just so magnetic. And I realized that that attraction sort of died after that. Like I didn't feel that connection with him as much anymore because I was doing that for myself, because that had more to do with my wounding and the fact that I wasn't seen as a child, that I wasn't given the love that I really deserved as a child. Um, I was doing it more to get that, to almost feel like I was living through him. Then, and then when I brought that back into my life, I didn't necessarily feel attracted to those kinds of people anymore. Like I was the magnetic person. I was the person who could talk to people easily. I was the person who could do that. And because these, these traits are, are traits that anyone can have if you just pretty much just embody them. Like being a confident person is kind of like being a confident person. You can decide you are one. Mm. So that's kind of how I've embodied it. That's one of the ways. Yeah, that it really, really worked for me. And it worked for a lot of the people that I work with, too. Yeah, yeah, that's a very confident person thing to do. <laughs> right? <laughs> that whole process. So I'm, I'd be curious to know about your personal experience with mm -hmm. that, um, that partner who you talked about, because I think a lot of people find themselves magnetically attracted to somebody. And along with that is a deep fear of losing them, right? Maybe it's a fear of abandonment. Mm -hmm. And so if they hear about a, a process where, you know, um, 
you'll stop being magnetized to this person, right? Mm -hmm. They, part of them doesn't want to let go of that person and it's scary and they abandon themselves and they make choices to not have to lose them, this, this Mm -hmm. other person, right? And so you're saying like you did this healing work and then that person was able to exit your life and you were able to see how they were bad for you. Like, could you talk more about like, what was that like for you emotionally that helped? Did you find yourself like really trauma bonded to that person or was it difficult or painful or right? How, how did you find yourself letting go of like the fear of losing them through this process? Yeah. So with that particular partnership, um, I, that partner wasn't a good partner for me from the Mm -hmm. beginning. Mm -hmm. So it was so painful letting them go. Like, I'm not even going to lie. That's just that's not my thing. It was so <laughs> painful. Like it w- it really was because I felt like I was, I was losing this person, but I found healing on the, um, on the other end. And I felt like I was a much more whole human being when I did that. Now I've done this in my current relationship that I'm still in as well. Mm-hmm. And I looked at the things that he was embodying that I realized I really wanted for myself and I'm still in this partnership and this partnership is amazing. It's like, he's like the love of my life. Um, and it can still work if you're in partnership. So it's not necessarily that if you do this process, you always have to let go of that person. You always have to, you know, kick them to the curb. You don't always have to do that. But in like with Mel, um, my partner, when I first met him, what it really drew me to him was that he was so emotionally expressive. When I was younger, I was not allowed to express my emotions. If I was sad, angry, it was like, we don't want to hear it. You're going to have to do that somewhere else. <laughs> we, we don't want it. Um, and he is like a very like emotional person. When he feels something, he feels it to the full extent. And I was so attracted to that. I was like, oh my God, like this, he's just, oh, oh I can't, I can't get him on my head. So later on in our relationship, when I realized that I was wanting that for myself, I started to work with that, like starting to express it, especially when I started going through SLRC and uh, doing all the emotional uh, work and doing the emotional like expression, like those embodiment practices when you just like embody emotion that you're scared of, whether it's like, for me, it was like sadness and crying and like, you know, wailing, all of that, like anger I had, I was like, yeah, I got that. That's... (laughs) <laughs> I have no problem. But, um, but sadness was so hard for me to embody and like mm-hmm. just to be honest with myself and like deal with like times that I had failed or deal with the like sadness of like, you know, having someone that you love leave or any of these types of sadness. It did not ruin the attraction with my partner. Um, I'm attracted to him for different reasons. Before it was about being attracted to him because he was just like the embodiment of my shadow and I wanted that so much for myself. Mm -hmm. Um, when I took that away, I felt like I could actually see him as a person. Like he wasn't this archetype or paragon of what I had lost as a child. I could see him as a human being and all the different complexities of him being a human being and all of the, his different experiences. So I found that it's, it's not like that same attraction where you're just like obsessed with this person and you're like, I just can't stop thinking about them. They're just, you know, I just want to be with them all the time, but it's like this deep depth kind of love where I feel like I'm almost, it's almost feels like I'm so like attuned to him. Like we're almost like psychic, like, it's hmm. very, it's just like very deep and like very like, oh, like I don't have to get triggered because he said that thing. Like I know that he, you know, I used to get really triggered when he got like tired and it was like falling asleep on me. I would be like, oh my God, he doesn't want to talk to me right now. What the mm-hmm. heck? Mm-hmm. So now I kind of see that like, oh, like he is tired. <laughs> he's tired, like has nothing to do with me. And I'm gonna let him go and get that rest. And I'm gonna go over here and take care of myself. And it's just like this deep compassion for one another. It's a more compassionate love. Yeah. Yeah. And so what I'm hearing is that you had, you know, you were maybe attracted to these two individuals from the wounds, but the relationship that could be good for you, that could be repaired, that was with the help, could be a healthy partnership through doing this work that was fostered and built up more and made better. Whereas Mm -hmm. doing the same process where you had to let the partner go, 
right? It was a partnership that couldn't have survived that would have just been bad yeah. for you. And so Absolutely. it really depends on the ecosystem of the two, the two individuals. Mm-hmm. I think the benefit you, someone can really get the benefit of doing this work when they're single yeah. because you will start to attract such a different level of people mm. when you do this work. I, I really truly believe that like in your single and you have all these different wounds and you notice that you're dating the same kind of people. Like if you go back through all of your exes and they all have like a certain pattern to them or even a certain ending. Like I had this person that I was working with who had six partners who cheated on them. Or che- wow. So I was like, okay, like if you're like these people who've done this to you are terrible. Like we're not, they like what they did was not great. It was really, really heart breaking. And that does not take away from what they did. But you also have to ask yourself the question, how did you end up in six different relationships with six different people who treated you the same exact way and where that's coming from? And it was coming from their deep wounding. Mm -hmm. So after talking about this and working with those different parts and integrating them it was like okay now I can start to attract the people who are on a different level now the kind of people who are not trying to victimize me or not trying to use me because I'm empathic and Mm -hmm. things like that so I think the benefit is really great when you're single but it also works really well if you're in a deep committed relationship Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and what you were starting to give the example there about with um a partner or a client or a friend who had had a lot of people cheat on her. Um, I was wondering if you wanted to dive more into maybe that example or another example in relation to shadow, like how can we understand better our own shadows and how they show up in the choices that we make? Yeah. So with her, um, her biggest shadow was that, it's kind of like, I feel like sometimes when people think shadow, they always think the bad stuff. But for her, her shadow was really all about being enough that she put, like, she had this idea of just being a burden. Like, that is who I am. Like, I don't, I don't want to talk to anyone. I don't want to have boundaries. Like, I don't, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to say anything. I don't want to speak up. And like her shadow, the part of herself that was really pushed back because she wasn't necessarily like this her entire life, but the part of herself that was pushed back was that fire. She lost that fiery part of herself that was willing to really stand up for herself because she wasn't always like that. When she was a child, she was very talkative, very like, um, you know, I'm curious. I want to go into this. I want to go into that. Like, what's this person do? I'm going to say how I feel. But at some point when she was growing up, she was told that that was not appropriate like talking too much is not appropriate like being that kind of person is not appropriate so we got pushed back into the shadow and I feel like a lot of people think that the shadow is always a negative thing but it's more about what gets pushed in the back of your subconscious Mm -hmm. what behaviors what archetypes what paragons are being told are not appropriate not supposed to be there not supposed you're not supposed to feel this way you're not supposed to you know think about things this way that's the that's the shadow and for her her shadow was really about her her fire her ability to stand up for herself she said it was like a like a fiery like uh like phoenix type when we were doing the practice it was like oh like this fire this phoenix and it was it's really amazing but (laughs) but but i think that for her um it kind of created this dynamic where she would uh, specifically attract these like love bombers, like people who like in the beginning, they would come in real strong. Like they would know you for two weeks and it'd be like, I'm in love with you. You know, you're the most amazing thing in the world. I want to be with you and stuff like that based off of no real information based off of nothing. Cause they you can't possibly know someone in two weeks. It's just not something that is possible. And, um, those kinds of people, those love bombers um, who are getting in like quick and then they distance themselves over time, like almost creating a little bit of an addiction. Like scientists have literally compared it to being addicted to gambling. Like it's about the same feeling when someone shows up with that much intensity and then gives you breadcrumbs afterwards, right? With the inconsistent rewards. Hmm. So she stopped dating people like that 
or stop being attracted those like kind of people because if you're the kind of person who you are pretty integrated those people are not really necessarily going to target you either because you're you're going to be like you only know me for two weeks like I don't <laughs> why are you saying you love me I don't know you what are you doing <laughs> stop that <laughs> you know? yeah yeah so um, that's how that shadow mm-hmm. piece really showed up for mm-hmm. uh this particular person that I was working with yeah, yeah. she was great but yeah Yeah, no, that's really helpful, I think, because a perspective on shadow and what it means. And I really relate to that story and have had, you know, a shadow that's very similar where it took a while to break down some of those pieces because they seemed good, right? So, like, I had sort of the same thing of, like, my very existence or my having needs is a burden. Um, Mm. And so... I, you know, was a super overachiever, like basically overachiever, um, super independent. These things are venerated by society. Like these they things, are. people think that I'm, you know, very capable and I have all these good qualities, but they were shadow. Like they were just a fake version covering up the, that core wound. Um, and, you know, had the same experience of attracting like the love, the love bomber types who go in very fast, who are narcissistic, who, right, mm-hmm. want to exploit your, want to exploit you instead of have true intimacy with you. And yeah. I think that's a really important, important message for our listeners and our viewers as well, because it doesn't just mean, you know, your shadow isn't when you feel angry or when you feel triggered or when you, right, like, that's not your actual yeah. shadow. Like your shadow is super tricky and your shadow leads you to believe that, right, what you, that you are um, a victim of your circumstance or that you can't be empowered or that you, right, um, that, you're, that you're good in all of these ways and this other person is so wrong or, right, these have been some experiences um, that I've seen of shadow where people, um, where you maybe don't realize that that's what's operating there. Yeah. No, I've actually like with the emotional piece within myself, I feel very similar to me because I feel like, like society really glorifies like being a super analytical person, you know, not crying, not being emotional, especially like, um, being conditioned as a woman. It's like, Oh, you know, like, I don't want you to be like, don't go crazy. Like, don't, you know, don't be super emotional. Like, you know, all that kind of stuff. Like, so like I thought I'm like, Oh, you know, I'm not being emotional. Like, like clearly this just means that I'm great. Like, that's just, yeah. what, this is great. <laughs> yeah. Like <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? And, <laughs> and that was not the case. That was not the case at all. When I started breaking down those walls of like, um, of all of those different emotions, there was a tsunami of emotions and I and I should have known because I'm a poet and I would write all these poems and they would have all this stuff I'm like I don't know what that's about but you know that's a lot I'm gonna go put that in my journal and call it a day <laughs> um and it that that's just all of that like pent up stuff inside of me um you know that is that shadow pieces like they're not always like negative experiences they can they can be just part of the human experience that we are just not allowing ourselves to have. Yeah. Not, not our authentic self, right? No. It's a fake self. It's like a shadow that that's what it means to me is it's like a, something I've constructed. That's not truly me. And yeah. so this work, I think that we all are doing and we help clients do is to, is a journey to find your authentic self. Yeah. And your authentic self is always going to be more attractive, more magnetic, Mm -hmm. more um, bring in more love, more honest love, more vulnerable love than you would have if you were walking around with a false self, right? If everyone's walking around with a mask and you attract another person who's wearing a mask, that's what you're going to get. You're going to get a mask love. Yeah. So the more real that you can be with yourself and the more integrated you can be with yourself, the deeper your love can be. Yeah. I have chills. (laughs) Truth bombs. (laughs) So good. That was so good. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of what, you know, we teach and believe in, like those of us who are doing these, this talk series is being in the body, right? And experiencing emotions mm-hmm. in the body and experiencing pleasure and 
um, and trusting our intuition from our body. And uh, the, when you were speaking to being very analytic and not being emotional, yeah. you know, our society says that's a good thing. But I've found as well, I'm sure you've seen this too, that mm-hmm. we are, can be controlled by our minds, right? You can analyze your way through anything. You can talk yourself into oh. anything. Like I work with women oh, who have been gaslit, right? And a big realization that's common to happen is like, oh, I, I gaslight myself. Like I, I am the one that consumes this and self-justifies and over and over through the analysis, but your body does not lie. Like those Mm-mm. sensations cannot lie to you. And when you get in touch with them and what they're telling you and learn to trust them and learn to work with them, like that is where that authenticity is born. And that's where the true you is born, I think. Oh, no, I absolutely agree with you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, there's no such thing as cognitive dissonance in the body. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there's no such thing. <laughs> like, like, you're going to get the truth when it comes to your body. Your body does not lie. And uh, I resonate so much with what you just said. Um, because like, like you said, like having that analytical side of your brain, you can gaslight yourself, especially if you're in a toxic relationship. I cannot tell you all of the different stories that I came up with when I was in that most toxic and vulnerable relationship, how many things I told him, I'm like, well, he's just tired. Like, you know, he's just, he's mad at me because, you know, I did something wrong. Like Mm -hmm. I just, I, you know, he, it's okay. You know, it's okay for him to do that because of this reason or that reason. And you can totally guess like yourself, Mm -hmm. you know, but if I were to really look back at how I was feeling, like, um, just the amount of stress my body was under, I grew gray hairs. Like I was like 19 and I had like gray hairs, like, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm when this being in this constant state of stress, like your body does not lie. So getting in touch with it is like one of the best barometers that you can possibly have, yeah. especially when it comes to other people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm curious if, if, if somebody's listening to this and they're mm-hmm. hearing themselves and, and what you're saying and yeah. in desiring to take the steps to have these, more authentic relationships to start dating in this more authentic way, but like they feel scared or overwhelmed or they're not sure how to make it happen. What would you say to them? Um, I would always say start small, start small, even if it's like um, only a few minutes. Um, If you can identify one pattern in your relationships and write it down, that's a step. If you can sit down with your body and just notice the sensation for two minutes, that's a step, Mm -hmm. right? Um, If you can just think about the parts of yourself or if you, I love this one. I always do this. Um, I try to babysit my thoughts and I try to think about like, I'll have these moments when I'm like having a conversation around and I'll have like a thought go by and it'll be like, you shouldn't say that. You shouldn't do that. And just taking the time to be like, well, what, what's that? What, what is that? What, where, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> what, what is that? Where is that coming from? Why shouldn't I say that? And just having that, um, like, just really start starting to pay attention. Um, a lot of the people that I work with, I tell them to meditate, like, as, as one of their biggest things. Like, even if it's, like, five minutes, even if it's one minute, like, the best practice you could possibly have is the one that you do. Like I said, if you can getting connected with connected to your body, um, and then also embodying, you know, that's a that was a huge mm-hmm. transformation for me personally. Um, was taking those things that I say, oh, you know what, like you can't be confident, like you can't, you can't do that, and just for a week being like, you know what, I'm gonna I'm going to pretend like I'm confident. I'm going to pretend like this is who I am. I'm going to pretend like this is just you know, step into that role and just see how it feels. You know, it doesn't have to feel, you know, good. It could kind of feel like wearing shoes. Like if you wear like a new pair of shoes, you know, you got to break it in a little bit, you know, go outside with it, walk around before you <laughs> <laughs> give it a little something, yeah. but you know, and see how it feels, you know, just 
doing the smallest possible thing to allow your brain to go, oh, this is safe. Okay, no lion killed me. Like, all right, you know, I, I meditated for five minutes. Just letting your brain know that if you make these changes, that it's safe. Because when you can get resistance um, with anything that is new, that's our brain trying to protect us. You know, our brain doesn't want us to do something new and then that new thing end up like killing us or something, you know? And our brain doesn't know the difference between a lion and meditation. It really doesn't. It has no idea. <laughs> it's just like, this is just not, this is what you're you doing before. So you're not going to be doing it, not in this house. Like, <laughs> that way. Your, your brain really doesn't know the difference between um, like something scary as a lion eating you and like just sitting down and meditating. It has no idea. It is trying to keep you safe. And that's what our brains are for. Like they want to make us safe. So you just got to kind of like work with it and do that little bit so that your brain can signal like, oh, okay, like this was safe. All right. Dipping my toe in the pool. It's like not too bad. You know, I'll stick my foot in now. You know, I found that that's the best way to do it because like, and then um, what helped me with accountability when it comes to this practices is when I would like not want to do like five minutes of meditation, I'd write down why I didn't want to do it. And nine times out of 10, I'd be like, all right, I could do this. Like the, by the time I'm done <laughs> writing this down, yeah. I could have done the five minute meditation. Yeah. Yeah. That's brilliant. Yeah. And I think too, when we write the same thing, if it's a pattern, we write down our excuses mm-hmm. over and over again, we get bored of the excuses, right? We yeah, see it enough so times, true. it like stops being novel. And we're like, this is boring now. Like I've seen this enough times that I don't mm-hmm. need to pay attention to this. Um, yeah, that's really helpful, I think, too, because I think, you know, it's a, it can be a process and, and we, we don't get to the end right of way and it can be difficult to know how to start. So hearing that it just is like literally baby steps and that that's what makes your brain able to process it and not be afraid of it and to allow you to embody those changes, um, is, is a great advice as well as like spending a week embodying whatever that particular quality is and what would it be like to move through the world in that and yeah. know that you're practicing. Yeah. That's a great bite-sized advice. Yeah. yeah. Oh, <laughs> I, was, uh, I just love this subject so much. <laughs> yeah. No, it's so important. It's so important. And it, um, it really empowers people when they decide to make this shift to take like self-responsibility like deep radical responsibility for their dating life and for their relationships and ultimately that's empowering because what's disempowering is to feel like we can't do anything about it that we have no choice that we attract this person or that person or people always take advantage of us or yeah those are very disempowered stances so this Mm -hmm. gives people a real tool to um to shift out of that and to actually change their experience willfully yeah and on the subject of responsibility i think something that um, a lot of people get confused about is the difference between taking self-responsibility and fault and blame Mm -hmm. like taking self-responsibility is not the same as things being your fault Mm -hmm. like if i'm in an ocean and there's a giant wave coming um, I don't have to be like, oh, it's my fault that wave is coming. It is, it's going to hit me and it is my <laughs> fault. I am to blame, right? Because that's disempowering. But what you can do is I am responsible for the actions that I take. I am responsible for riding, riding this wave. I'm responsible for how I'm going to respond to this wave and my actions. Mm-hmm. Like I'm taking responsibility for that, not necessarily taking the blame for things because those are two different things. Yeah. Yeah. They're kind of opposite, right? I mean, when we Mm -hmm. feel guilt or blame, it's, it's a way to kind of, uh, bypass having to take responsibility. Mm -hmm. Oh, that, yeah, I, a hundred percent. Um, when I fall into that, like kind of almost victim mentality, that's just like, uh, like everything is just happening to me. Like there's nothing that I can do. Like that can sometimes feel so much more comforting than there's something that I can do. Right. Cause I feel like when you, when there is something that you can do, then 
it can get to that layer of fault. Like, oh, well, if there was something that I could do, then it's my fault. And if it's my fault, then I'm wounded, I'm damaged, I'm, I'm not worthy. And that's not really what it's about. That's kind of like a way to not take the actions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And I think taking the action sometimes are what people are resistant to and, mm -hmm. and like part of what I'm sure you do also as a coach is help people with the tools like you shared with us earlier, like how you can yeah. start to do that in a way that's manageable and safe and right, understanding that, right, we're responsible for how we ride the wave or for getting out of the way of the wave or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's okay. Right. There's nothing yeah. wrong here. Like I feel like guilt and blame um, always carry the undertone of like something's wrong. Something's wrong. You're yeah. doing something. I'm doing something wrong. You're doing something wrong. Right. And what the shift that you're really calling for is I'm hearing it is like you're I'm responsible for for what's present and it's okay. Mm -hmm. It's okay that this is present. I can do this. I can show up for it. I can yeah. make these choices. Whatever choices I make are okay. And it's a very completely different energy. Yeah, it is. I mean, sometimes you have to give yourself the space to have what I like to call tantrum time. That's yeah. just my personal thing. <laughs> like, no one has I like it. But I call it tantrum time. Like when, you know, um, like recently I made a, an Instagram um, and it got like banned for they thought I was a bot. And I was just like, <sighs> I'm going to give myself 10 minutes to beat the crap out of this pillow yeah. and to just be really frustrated and to just be like, why? <laughs> you know, for 10 yeah. minutes. Yeah. And then I can be like, okay, like, so what are we going to do next? Like, cause I feel like when I give myself tantrum time, then I'm less likely to go into that mindset while I'm trying to do other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Our emotions need containers. It needs a they container do. of time. Like this is your container. You be you. You take over, so that that emotion is not then controlling your life when it's not meant to, or you don't want it to. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So um, I just think that you know, taking the step and being that person that you want to date, like really taking those steps um, to figure out, you know, when you are not living from your subconscious, who do you actually love, and what kind of people do you actually want to be around. Yeah. Um, it's such a great way to take self-responsibility of your life in yeah. general. You can apply this embodiment practice to pretty much any area of your life. When you long to traits in other people, you can apply that to your own life. You may not be able to have the same exact things, but you can always embody the feeling. You may not be able to have the same exact life, but you can always embody the feeling. Like, you know... Um, I'll give you an example. I like, I write poetry and, uh, there was this woman that I knew who write poetry and she like came out with a book and I was like, so in my feels about it. Cause I didn't, you know, I haven't finished my book and I was just like, oh. <laughs> she had a book. Well, well, that book's not even good. It's just, it's just not even good. And I, <laughs> and I realized it's because I, I really wanted to do that for myself. And I couldn't necessarily get the book, but what I could do is uh, reaffirm my own worthiness. Like, yeah, like you write beautiful poetry, like you write wonderful things. Like you, you script your, your words on a page very beautifully. Like you, you know, I can still take that feeling without doing the actions. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And you do like, write beautiful poetry, and I love Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so do you um, want to share your where people can find you if they want to yeah. follow you or find your website or anything? Yeah, so, yeah, so right now you can find me on Instagram. That's, like, the platform that I'm most active on. Mm -hmm. And um, you can follow me at Erotic Ren Aaron. Um, so that's spelled just erotic r-e-n aaron um a-r-y-n okay so you can find me there that's where i'm like posting all of my stuff about practices that i use and poetry and things that um have really been helpful for me and i even do like story chats where i talk on the story about the different things that <laughs> are going on and different practices. So if you want to catch up with me, that's where you can find me. 
Awesome. I'll be happy to have you. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> well, thank you so much for this conversation today. It was so much fun and I think really important you know, information and ideas and concepts for our listeners to consider. But thank you yeah. so much for being here. I had so much fun doing this conversation and I love this topic. So yeah, thank you for having me, Elizabeth, and doing this interview and showing up with your energy and all that good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you.